Oh, and Joey is up next. I guess most of you know who Joey is, but as introduction, Joey is the author of Git Annex. He's an emeritus Debian developer who designed and developed many core Debian tools such as Deb Helper, and he also developed many other useful Git-based utilities such as my repos, etc, C Keeper. He has also been working with the DataLab project since uh, 2014. So welcome, Joey. Um, and he'll be talking about Git Annex is complete, right? So. There's the HDMI. Second, let me get my uh, video set up. Uh. Ah, is it? It's already oh, it's already working. Well, wow, thank you, Gnome. Okay. <laughs> so, this is a question um, Git Annex is complete, right? Which I first heard it from my father after I'd been working on it for about a year. You know, he's like, you've been working on this for a long time. You're, you're pretty much done, right? And he's asked me that again pretty much every time I see him. <laughs> um, but I've also heard it from technical people who understand the software is never actually done. But they're still like, well, you're pretty much, you're done. You've, it's feature complete, right? So, you know, I've been thinking about this question for a while, and it turned out to be unexpectedly topical. Anybody who's following tech news knows about XZ and how it seemed complete, and then people were like, well, no, we can do something else, and then horrible things happened. Hopefully that's not gonna happen to me. Um, <laughs> but um, I wanted to kind of look at this question, is Git Annex complete, by looking at the surface area of Git Annex in the ecosystem that it's in. Um, I'm kind of thinking about what directions has Git Annex grown as, I've, as it's developed? And I'm sorry if this looks a little bit like a cell or something, I couldn't help myself. Um, <laughs> so if you, if you look at Git Annex, you know, it's kind of in between Git and the web and lots of other things. And it kind of started as a very simple core, you know, just simple, simple abilities. You can add files, you can get them, you can drop them. You know, and um, but it but right right away because it's a very distributed system, it had to develop this special thing, the Git Annex branch, this little organelle over here, that kind of powers it to do a lot of other things, and that was a lot of added complexity. It suddenly exploded the surface area because once I had that ability to store kind of data about file about large files in the repository. I started building things like the metadata system, which you know just simply lets you store metadata attached to files. Now, that was probably the first extension where I was like, is, is this actually something I should be putting into Git Annex? Because my, my mandate is large files in Git. What does metadata really have to do with it? You might want metadata on any file. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, but, but I did it anyway because it was easy, uh, <laughs> which is probably a bad way to design software, but it, it, it seemed to work out. Um, so the really important um, extension of the surface area, the one that really changed everything, um, at first Git Annex was only, you would pull files down from a Git Annex repository, you'd push them to another Git Annex repository. It was Git repositories all the way. But then I was like, well, wait, we have all these key value stores out there on the internet. And I made the special remotes interface. And, um, and this thing extends Git Annex into a direction where it's kind of an open system because there's a, basically an infinite number of key value stores out there. Um, <laughs> so uh, suddenly the surface area can just expand without bounds. So in a way, it's never gonna be complete. That was my thinking. But then, um, after talking with the Eric, I think, along came the idea of, well, let's just split these things out into their own programs. And all of a sudden now, it's like, okay, great. It's, ex it's open, it's expandable. Anybody can add a program that knows how to talk to a specific data store, and it becomes part of the GNX repository. So that kind of saved me from having to implement every single uh, key value store on Earth in Haskell, which was not a feasible thing anyway, um, so I ended up with basic things like S3 and um, 
you know, various other uh, web dev and stuff like that, but I didn't have to implement the, like the things that Eric was talking about, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, there have been other expansions of the surface area. This web app over here is definitely my least favorite um, of them because I, I was like, well, Gnax is hard to use. Well, I guess I'll make some kind of a web interface for it and then it will be easy to use. And that's great until you get users who want something that's easy to use and it's actually not working for them and you're one person. And then it's like, ooh, maybe this isn't the right direction. But it's kind of hanging around as this appendage. And Eric just said it was useful in his talk. He likes the assistant part of it. So that's great. It's still there. It still works. But, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that I would like to avoid extending Gdanix into these areas where it turns out not to be a good idea, obviously. But um, right now, I'm kind of like, is there something else? Is there another place that this is going to grow? And for a long time, I haven't really been seeing it. The, the newest thing that seems to have some promise is the tree import and export, which is pretty similar to what Yarek was talking about, where, where um, you have some kind of um, repository out there, and you just want to pull down the files from it, add them to your repository, or at least know about them, and then you, then you can manage them just like you've, checked, you've added them in any other way. Um, the idea with this is basically we'll take all the special remotes, which are key value stores, but we can also say, well, what if it has a bunch of files in it with file names that actually matter? We'll, we'll basically pull from that as if it were a Git repository and make a Git branch, just like you had said, Git fetch from a Git repository, and then you can merge it in or whatever. Um, when, when export is supported, it also does the equivalent of Git push, so it, it, it will upload files to that. Um, this is a neat thing, I think, but also it, it's kind of redundant to what's in Datalad. But of course, Git Annex is, you know, in some ways larger than Datalad. It, it wants to be usable by people who aren't in, interested in Datalad in any way because they're not scientists, for example. Um, and this is still kind of new. It, I mean, it's a few years old, but I, I want to do more development work on it. Um, a lot of special remotes aren't supported by it yet, and the external ones are barely supported at all. You can, um, you can export, but you can't import. Um, so that's definitely a way that the surface area might grow. But still, it kind of seems like when I think about the big things that I'm working on now, they don't actually extend Gdanix into a new realm. They're kind of backfilling where I was like, oh, this is too hard, like 10 years ago. I was, you know, like there, there's a thing called distributed migration that I just added, which lets you migrate a key between, say, SHA-1 uh, SHA and SHA-256. But um, it solves an issue that Gnaxis migration has had um, where you want to do that in every repository because you don't want to have to, you don't want to migrate once and then have to send all the content back out that's already on other repositories. So I added distributed migration this year. It's a great feature, but it doesn't extend the surface area at all. It just makes it a little bit easier for people who need this one specific use case. So I've been thinking about this actually since I submitted the talk and I was like, well, maybe it's complete. Like in a way it's complete. It's not going to grow in a significant way. Um, you know, Datalad seems fairly happy with it. You know, occasionally there's a new interface or something. And Datalad has kind of actually added a huge quantity of surface area, which I don't have to worry about, and that is wonderful. <laughs> you know, and, and that's good. It, you know, it's, this is not a, a small, simple system, but it doesn't need to grow without bounds either, right? And we have a name for that. When we have cells growing without bounds, we don't want that. So, <laughs> Um, but then I got to thinking, and I came up with a little idea <laughs> last month. Um, so this is a pretty typical network. Say that um, the, the square over here with the connected to everything else is, say, your laptop, and then you have some repositories local to you. It might be a hard drive and somebody else's computer and, I don't know, an S3 remote up in the cloud, whatever. Um, you know how to, you have Git Annex set up to talk to these things, great, you're able to push and pull files, store things, but here, here along comes somebody else, and you're like, oh, well, I have five different repositories, uh, they have three different access control methods, 
Uh, I actually can't like just give you access to this hard drive that I plug in now and then, or I don't know, it's, it, it, it's a mess. You, you're trying to give them access to this, but basically what you come up with at that point is, well, we're gonna push it to the cloud and then you can pull it from the cloud, which is great if you have you know, bandwidth, money, everything you need to use the cloud. But if you're just trying to do this locally or on a small network, this is a problem. And you, what you could do is you could just say, well, friend, here you can connect to my laptop, you can get any files that I have on the laptop. If you want something else, just let me know and I'll pull it down off of one of these other remotes and then you can get it from my laptop. Great, and you can send me files to my laptop and I'll copy them out to wherever. You could do this manually. I don't think many people do this because it seems like a real pain. And when I was thinking about this, I'm like, this is an area where Git Annex is really not, it, it wants to be a fully distributed system. It wants to be peer to peer. It's kind of too peer to peer because it makes it really hard to deal with the situation. So I came up with this simple idea of let's not have this be manual things you're doing on your laptop. Let's have a proxy, which is Git Annex. When this thing wants a file over here, it just tells the proxy, hey, I would like a file from the S3 remote. Please stream it down through and send it to me. Or it can say, hey, I'd like to send a file to that drive over there that I've heard you have. I don't know anything about it, but please send it through the proxy and it'll land on the drive. Um, so, of course, you can extend this further. You could say, oh, well, actually, yeah, I have some drives of my own. I'll be a proxy, too. You know, you can now pull and push things in every direction you can think of. Um, you know, you could be over here on this computer, use this proxy to talk to that proxy to get a file off of this drive. You could think of these as two different um, geographical locations, maybe. You know, you could, it's your typical proxy kind of distributed network system, but Gnx hasn't really supported this. So I have kind of a design for this, but I haven't actually worked it all the way out. Um, there's a lot of difficulties. Um, in a way, you could think of this as two clusters, or one cluster, say, and you just, from over here, you don't really care about these drives. You don't want to need to know which drive do I put a file on. How full is this drive? What happens if this drive gets too full because I put files on it? You know. You just want to say, okay, I'm gonna spread things out among the cluster, and I have a design that I came up with 10 years ago and revisited, because I, 10 years ago I was like, I can't quite make this work, um, to balance files between these uh, drives um, using Git Annex's preferred content system, which is what lets the repository say, I want a file if these conditions are met. Um, so I have kind of a design for that, and it turns out that one of the key things that I need to implement this is to deal with the uh, what if the drive becomes full question because if you're, sto if you're kind of like round robin storing files between different repositories, more or less at random, some of the files are bigger than other ones, some of the drives are probably bigger than other ones, it's a heterogeneous network probably. Um, and one of them will fill up first and then if you just keep trying to send this file to this full repository, it's, it's pointless. You're just banging your head against a wall. So instead, there needs to be a way for you to learn from over here that this drive is full. Oddly enough, the first probably six months I was writing Git Annex, I had at least two users come to me and say, you know, I really, it would be cool if you could keep track of how much free space there was left on a remote. And I was like, that's too hard, I'm not gonna do that. It's a distributed system, why? <laughs> so I've revisited that, I, I have a design to do that now. <laughs> It's actually a lot easier than it seemed 12 years ago. <laughs> I guess I have more experience with this kind of thing. So I have kind of a general idea of how to do this. I'm really curious to know if it will actually extend how people, um, you know, in your, in your realms use Git Annex potentially, because it kind of seems to me that if you're like, I don't know, a lab or something, and you're trying to collaborate with somebody else, this might be helpful when you don't have to actually go through the institution and say, here's all the you know, difficulties of actually, doing it right isn't the right way to put it, but we're just ad hoc doing something before we actually publish, you know, something like that. So this, I think, would extend Git Annex's surface area in a useful way. Um, and I've actually applied for a grant to build this, but I don't know if I'll get the grant. Um, <laughs> so I'm searching for funding, basically. <laughs> I think this is gonna take about three, four months of work. It's, you know, it's a reasonably sized project. Um, how am I doing on time? Do I have time? Oh, good, okay. Wonderful. 
So, yeah. Um, so getting back to the question, I don't think it's done, but on the other hand, that idea might be the last big idea. It's possible. If so, great. Um, I have also to-do lists this long. They're all good ideas. I haven't had time to implement them, or I haven't figured out how. Um, and of course, I have a bug list that's 10 times that long. <laughs> and I'm still finding significant bugs. Um, I found one last week that I just was like, how has this been here the whole time? And I've never noticed. Um, yeah. Um, but I wanted to point out something else. Uh, a surface area uh, increase that has kind of been lurking here on this slide all along. I don't know if you've noticed, but I, whenever I hear people talk about data lab, they talk about this, this thing right here. And data lad run, they seem to like it a lot. They're like, this is really cool. It lets me like, you know, do provenance as I update my whatever. I don't know what they do. They're scientists. I don't understand anything. <laughs> but I understand that this is cool. And I'm like, hmm, it, it seems kind of close to things that I do. It's kind of storing data in a, like metadata -y things about files in a branch. W would it make sense to like you know, give this to people who aren't scientists, would they find a use for it? I don't know, maybe like if you're a photographer, a professional photographer and you have RAWs and you want to, you know, post-process them in a reproducible way, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but eh, it's worth thinking about. <laughs> so um, I could talk about more things on here, but I'm, I think I'm actually gonna run under rather than run over. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, the, I think that I've covered everything I really need to. So, um, you know, like I said earlier, I'm really interested in talking to people here and learning how GNAX is working for you, how it isn't working for you. Maybe you have ideas that actually do expand the surface area in some way. Maybe you think that this uh, proxy idea might have some legs for you in your organization or whatever. I would love to talk to people about anything like this. Um, I, I don't feel that GNX needs to keep being developed forever. I think that, uh, you know, I, I see what you've done with DataLad where you've refactored, you know, I was really happy to see this, like you refactored all the special purpose stuff out and got to a general purpose tool, which is awesome. And I'm like, in some ways you've made it, you've made it simpler as you've gone, which is a really admirable thing. Um, and I've sometimes thought, well, maybe I should you know, factor some of these things out into their own programs, but then again, that would just be work. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'm, I'm rattling on now, but thank you for uh, your attention, and I would love to chat with any of you about this. Thanks, Joey. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have time for like yeah, one or questions. two questions, Everybody if anyone wants, wants to jump in. Sure. I have a clarification question. When yep. you're talking about uh, this interface layer, is it about chunking data into different repositories, or is right. it really about having different sources that all have a complete copy and then just it, iterating between them? Because I feel like question. Datalet has that, but yeah. I always struggle to use it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, th this may well replicate something in Datalet that I don't know about, because I really know very little about Datalet. I know what Datalet needs from Git Annex, and I don't know how they're using it in detail, and I'll occasionally find something like Yarek, um, we call the special remote that then gets the tarball that then calls the special remote that does something, and I'm like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> but um, as far as the question about chunking, that's a great question, because I was thinking about that uh, just the night before last, I think. Maybe it's better to actually chunk the things and spread them out as chunks, rather than as the whole object, I don't know. But that's dangerous, right? If, if one goes exactly. down, then you have to... But, but of course, the, um, you know, the thing where I was talking about, um, the preferred content where it balances, you can do uh, N of M kind of balancing, so you know that at least two nodes have a copy of every chunk or whatever. So I might think about um, making chunking be an option or be the only way, and I haven't really decided, obviously. I think one of the downsides would be, in some of these situations, you know, you may actually have several computers that are all being used by people and they just want to have whatever files they have, but you'd like to be able to access them via the proxy anyway, and so you don't want chunks. But maybe if you have a cluster, you really do want chunks. Maybe it simplifies things. You don't have to rebalance, stuff like that. If you have chunks that are always the same size or smaller. Yeah, so great question. Eric, or anybody. 
somewhat relates to Chunkin. Uh, did you ever consider binary diffing files? Because what we have quite often is like small changes yeah. to files. Great question. Um, I wish, uh, let's see if this will come back up. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, so have I considered it? Yes. Um, have I implemented it? Oh, no. Uh, but is there a way to implement it? Yeah, um, kind of. So I meant to talk about the uh, special remotes. There's one which is the Borg backup special remote. The way this works is you use Borg, which is a backup tool. You back up your Git Annex repository to wherever, the, you know, a Borg repository. Then you say, hey, Git Annex, I backed up your repository using Borg. It's over here. Git Annex looks at it and says, oh, cool. I know everything that's stored in this Borg repository. Now, Borg does do uh, deltas. Um, it's designed to do that. And so it handles all the heavy lifting, and now you have a special remote that you can pull files out of, directly out of the backup system, or the archival system, it might be better to think of it. Because if it's a backup system, you're gonna rotate and lose data, which isn't what you want in this case. Um, now, as far as putting it in Git Annex itself, I've always felt like it's better to, you know, defer to somebody who actually can think about, you know, rolling hashes and stuff without their head exploding, because mine is continually exploded on this topic for years, so, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, we'll go on to the next talk. Yeah. Thank you, Joey. Thank you. <laughs>